everybody, and welcome to lecture number six in the first IHF medical webinar series. My name is Courtney Gayen, and I'm the moderator for this session this afternoon. We have three translation languages available for you today for this lecture, French, Spanish, and Arabic. And you can find these at the bottom of your screen on Zoom by clicking the globe icon marked interpretation and selecting the label for your language. If you're watching on Facebook right now, we are going to share the Zoom link in the comments so you can still join us on Zoom if you would like to use these translation options. This first IHS medical webinar series forms part of the virtual academy introduced by the IHS now six months ago to facilitate global online learning solutions and ultimately licensing. All of this falls under the umbrella of the IHS Education Centre, available at ihseducation.ihs.info. Today's lecture focuses on foot and ankle injuries in handball and is presented by Associate Professor Mahmoud Abouzid, Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Consultant Foot and Ankle Surgery at Benha University in Egypt. As always, please feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture and we will stop to address as many of those as we can as possible. And also please note this is being recorded so you will be able to access it later for on-demand viewing. So welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, all. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Hosni Abdurrahman for a great invitation. I hope this meeting find you all well. Today, we'll spoke about the foot and the ankle injuries in handball. We'll start with the introduction. Handball is a high intensity sport with frequent physical contact between players. The purpose of our meeting today to refresh our knowledge about incidence of foot and ankle injuries in handball, risk factors for injuries, classifications of injuries, types of injuries, prevention of injuries, and lastly, the questions. The available scientific data regarding the incidence of injuries in handball is mainly related to the time loss injuries, not to all injuries. Each team can expect about one injury causing time loss from sport participation every fourth match played. The majority of acute injuries in handball are located in the lower extremity regardless of age and gender. The most frequent injury location reported in handball is the ankle. The incidence of all types of injury is higher when playing a match than during training. The incidence of injuries increases towards the middle of each half and decreases towards the ends. And 45% of the injuries occurs in the middle 10 minutes of both halves. 57% of injuries occur in the second half. Players playing a full match are the ones at the highest risk. Foot and ankle injuries can be classified into according to the time loss, time loss injuries and non-time loss injuries. According to the onset of the injury, acute injuries result from specific identifiable events and chronic injuries which represent an overused injuries caused by repeated microtraumas without unique identifiable event. According to the nature of the injured tissue, foot and ankle injuries can be classified into soft tissue injuries and bone injuries. Here we know a general look for the anatomy of the ankle joint, which is formed by the tibia, fibula, and the talus in the ankle mortis. And these are the related structures important, which is prone to injury in the ankle, in which the Achilles tendon attached to the calcaneal tuberosity. Here is the fibula and the anterior telofibral ligament attached from the anterior border of the lateral malleus of the fibula to the talus. This is the perineal tendons in which the perineal brevis comes anterior to the perineal longus tendon. 
you will start to represent the injuries of the ankle, firstly, the ankle sprain. The ankle sprain is a wide term represent lateral ankle sprain, deltoid ligament sprain, and syndesmotic injury. The lateral ankle sprains are the most frequent. This is the most common acute injury. The mechanism of injury of acute ankle sprain is inversion and the blunter flexion of the foot when landing off balance or clipping another player's foot. The lateral ligament structures are the anterior telofibular ligament, calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior telofibular ligament. The sequence of injury, firstly, the anterior telofibular ligament is commonly affected. Secondly, the calcaneofibular ligament, and lastly, the posterior telofibural ligament. The risk factors for the lateral ligament sprain are previous incompletely rehabilitated ankle sprain, calf muscle tightness, and subtle virus ankle malalignment. Players with subtle virus ankle malalignment are prone to continuous inversion, which lead to multiple ankle sprains. And this recurrent attack are the first risk factor for the injury. Clinically, we diagnose the lateral ankle sprain. There is a lateral side ankle pain, tenderness, edema, and ecchymosis, which is present at the distal part and anterior to the lateral malus of the fibula. The special test for the lateral ankle sprain, the anterior drawer test, which is beneficial mainly for chronic cases. And in acute cases, it is very painful. So it is beneficial for the chronic cases mainly. Radiologically, X-rays are done for the ankle sprains as anterior posterior view, lateral view, and stress view, mainly to exclude associated injuries, as uh, to exclude avulsion injuries at the tip of the lateral malus, exclude any associated fractures. Also, the MRI mainly done to exclude associated injuries, mainly the osteochondral defects of the ankle. So MRI does not diagnose the anterior telofibral ligament injury mainly, but to diagnose associated injuries, especially the OCD talus, the osteochondral defects of the talus are commonly associated with ankle sprain and can be missed. So this is the main goal for MRI. The lateral ankle sprain are graded into grade one and two and three. The grade one, which is the moderate, uh, which is the mild type, in which the anterior telofibular ligament overstretched with ligament fibers there, with minimal change on inversion, with negative anterior drawer test. In this grade, the anterior drawer test is negative. Grade two, which is moderate injury, the anterior telofibular ligament is completely torn. With the calcaneofibular ligament, there is a partial tear in the calcaneofibular ligament. We find a laxity on inversion with positive anterior drawer test. In grade three, which is a severe form of the sprain in which the anterior telofibural ligament, calcaneofibural ligament, and posterior telofibural ligament complete tear. This is a great ankle instability. The treatment consists of the acute phase, which in the first three days, we do rest from all activities that cause pain or limping, and if necessary, crutches was used until the patient can walk without pain or limping. You can place an ice pack on the ankle for 15 to 20 minutes and wrap an elastic bandage 
from the tooth to mid calf using even pressure and wear this until swelling decreases. Elevate the ankle above the heart level until the swelling subsides. These procedures are done in, during the acute phase. After the acute phase, which is the first three days, grade one and grade two, we encourage early active movement, which is very important. We start stationary cycling, walking with protective tabbing or semi-rigid brace as the ankle gel support. We give the player non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with physiotherapy program and functional progression to running, jumping, hopping, and cutting within six weeks. The most important treatment in this acute, after the second phase, after the acute phase, after the first three days is the physiotherapy program. The physiotherapy program, it shall starts as early as to relate it and consists of a towel crunches, you can spread the towel on the floor, pull it toward you with tools until the towel is fully gathered around your foot. This movement can be repeated for 10 to 15 minutes. Secondly, you can do ankle bumps in which is active dorsal flexion and blunter flexion of the ankle, as shown, and do towel stretches Sit on a hard surface with your injured leg stretching out in front of you. Then loop the towel around your foot and pull back to get a good stretch for 20 seconds. Secondly, you can bend your leg at a degree 90 angle and loop the towel around your full foot with your leg bent. 20 pull, you can look for 20 seconds. You can do marble pickup, in which you can grasp the ball between your first and second tools, pick up and transfer to the opposite pipe, and repeat for 15 to 20 times. Slant board stretch, you can stand with your heels on the board and learn forward. Stand with your knees bent and heels down. This can be repeated three times and the hold for 20 seconds. Here rises standing, balance yourself on both feet behind a chair or a table and rise upon your toes. Hold for three to five seconds and then lower yourself down. You can repeat this 10 times. As this gets easier, progress to single heel rise. Heel and toe walking, walk on your heels only for 30 rivets and walk on your toes only for 30 rivets. Two raises, stand in a normal way pairing position, rock back on your heels so that you, your toes come off the ground. Hold this position for three to five seconds and repeat it. 10 times. Single leg standing with your eyes open and closed. Single leg standing with your upper extremity motions. Single leg standing on various unsteady surfaces or using a BAP sport like shown in this photo. And the tandem walking. We observe in this old physiotherapy, we do a proprioception exercise, which is very important after the ankle sprain, especially the lateral ankle sprain. This proprioception exercise are strongly recommended, which helps to return to the activity as early as possible. Finally, the grade three in ankle sprain, we do aggressive rehabilitation as shown in grade one and grade two but surgical reconstruction should be strongly considered in which arthroscopic approach term and gold operation was done to reconstruct the ligament 
together with augmentation. The augmentation can be done with the anchor retinaculum or the internal brace. The medial side ankle sprain in which the deltoid ligament sprain, injuries to the deltoid ligament are reasonably uncommon. It has been estimated that isolated injuries account for about three to four percent of all ankle ligament injuries. Severe deltoid sprains are often associated with fibula or lateral malar fractures and other injuries. It is observed to be a result of an external rotation forth to the foot and the foot is inverted. A hallmark in diagnosis in deltoid ligament sprain, the tenderness at the medial gutter of the ankle joint. You can suspect the deltoid ligament injury from the edema distal to the tip of the medial malus or ecchymosis in the medial gutter of the ankle. In the acute phase of deltoid ankle sprain in the deltoid ligament sprain, you can do as shown as the lateral ligament sprain. In the latent phase, physiotherapy with return to light training should be delayed to about six to eight weeks as early stresses by returning too soon may lead to the ligament healing in a stretched position. This healing in a stretched position contributing to chronic ankle instability. The syndesmotic injury, the syndesmosis is the uh, ligaments in which in the tibia mm -hmm. and fibula. The incidence of syndesmotic injury represent 0.5% of all ankle sprains without fractures. And it represents 13% of all ankle fractures. This can be associated with 13% of ankle fractures. Clinical finds most commonly associated with external rotation injuries. It is an anterolateral ankle pain proximal to the anterior telofibular ligament, in which the anterior telofibular ligament pain is represented just distal and anterior to the tip of the lateral malus. The pain of syndesmotic injury is represented just above it. The patient may have medial sided ankle tenderness and swelling and difficulty in weight bearing. We can do the squeeze test or Hopkin test. The squeeze test is a compression of the tibia and fibula at the mid-calf level, which causes pain as the syndesmosis. The pain is elected at the syndesmosis node at the time at the, at the compression site. Radiological assessment for syndesmotic injury First, there is a decreased tibiofibular overlap. This is the tibiofibular overlap. Normally, more than six millimeter in AB view and more than one millimeter in mortis view. Secondly, we can find an increased medial clear space. This is the medial clear space, which is normally less than or equal to four millimeters. And finally, the increased tibiofibular clear space. This is the tibiofibular clear space, which is normally less than six millimeter on post EB and mortis views. The treatment of syndesmotic injuries consists of Firstly, conservative treatment in the form of non weight bearing cam boot or cast for two to three weeks. Syndesmotic sprain without diastasis or ankle instability can be treated with this conservative treatment. But operative reduction and fixation of the syndesmotic injury is indicated for. Syndesmotic sprain without fracture with instability on stress radiographs. Also, operative treatment is indicated for syndesmotic sprain refractory to the conservative treatment. 
and indicated also for syndesmotic injury with associated fracture that remains unstable after fixation of the fracture. Another item is the peroneal tendon injuries. The peroneal tendon injuries is usually associated with lateral ankle sprain. It usually represented from doors, forced doors flexion with slight inversion and reflex contraction of the tendon. Peroneal tendon injuries diagnosed by discomfort or swelling behind the lateral malleolus. And the tendon may be sublaxed on resistant doors flexion with eversion. Treatment in acute perineal tendon injuries, we can use a short non-weight bearing leg cast, but in chronic cases or perineal tendon rupture, surgical correction, usually we find a longitudinal tear like that. This longitudinal tear needs a surgical debridement and repair. The osteochondral lesion of the talus. Osteochondral lesions of the talus are usually suspected with delayed ankle sprain recovery. It usually, it usually present by pain, discomfort, locking, and instability. The investigations done for the osteochondral lesions are X-ray, like that. We see the lesion here at the corner of the talus, and CT scan and MRI and bony scan. We see this lesion at the medial corner, and this lesion in the MRI and the posterior part of the talus. The treatment of osteochondral lesion depends on the size of the lesion, in which small lesions, which is less one centimeter in width and less one centimeter in depth, can be treated arthroscopically by curate with loose buds removal. We do arthroscopic curettage and the drilling for the lesion. But larger lesions more than one centimeter in width and depth, we can do a mosaicoplasty or osteochondral autograft transfers. We can use an autograft from the lateral side of the knee in which non weight bearing part of the knee and introduce it in the ankle after removal of the diseased osteochondral defect. The anterior impingement syndrome, in which an exostosis at the end of the distal tibia and the talus due to repetitive traction or produced over injury to the anterior capsule of the ankle joint. Clinically, it is diagnosed by painful dorsiflexion, which may be limited. In lateral x ray view, there is an exostosis at the distal part of the tibia and an exostosis at the distal part of the talus. During doors deflection of the foot, an impingement or care causes pain and limited doors deflection. The treatment of these lesions represents an arthroscopic debridement of these exostosis. To remove these exostosis, and allow for painless doors flexion. The posterior impingement syndrome like as the anterior impingement one, but the cause is the presence of ostrigonum, which is an enlarged posterior process of the talus. Clinically, it represents high painful plantar flexion and painful motion of the grade two due to friction of the flexor hallucis longus tendon. The track of the flexor hallucis longus tendon passes just behind this pony process. So movement in the flexor hallucis longus causes friction and irritation of the flexor hallucis. So any movement of the grade two which lead to movement of flexor hallucis longus can induce pain. 
The treatment represents a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can last for six weeks. A failed conservative treatment, surgical treatment done by open or arthroscopic excision for this pony swelling. The sinus tersi syndrome. Sinus tersi is a concavity of the lateral tarsal canal of the subtalar joints. This is the sinus tersi. Is a canal at the lateral side between the calcaneus and the talus. Clinically, pain and discomfort in the front of the lateral malleolus, which has differential diagnosis with chronic lateral ankle sprain. Sinus tersi syndrome can be diagnosed by exclusion of other associated injuries. In this condition, MRI is needed to exclude space occupying lesion as ganglion in sinus tarsi. We can find a ganglion in this region, this ganglion which may produce a sinus tarsi syndrome. And this is the vein area. The treatment of sinus tarsi syndrome in which control over pronation together with deep post tibialis posterior muscle strengthening exercise. The tibialis posterior muscle strengthening exercise increase the medial longitudinal arch, so protect the sinus tarsi from over pronation and local injection. In resistant cases, surgical debridement can be used, but it is a uh, it is rare. Bersites around the heel, in which they are the retrocalcaneal bersites and posterior calcaneal bersites. It occurs due to ill fitting shoes or hagland deformity. The hagland deformity is a, a swelling, a pony swelling or a pony process at the upper surface of the calcaneus. This pony swelling leads to degeneration of the Achilles tendon and irritation on the surrounding bursa lead to bursites. The treatment in these bursitis is wrist tearing, physiotherapy, or surgical debridement. We can see this swelling in the bursitis. And this is an arthroscopic photo for inflamed bersa, which can be arthroscopically removed. Another cause of heel pain and injuries, which represent one of the chronic heel injuries, the heel fat bed syndrome. It is a disruption of fibro fatty protective tissue over the sensitive body ostium of the calcaneus. And it usually repeats. It is usually caused by repeated trauma. We can see the heel, and this is the disruption of this fatty, fibro fatty, protective tissues. The treatment, treatment in the form of decrease with bearing activities and weight reduction and orthotics. And we can use a semi-rigid molded heel cup or shoes with a firm heel contour. And you can avoid local injection as the local injection can decrease pain, but can lead to further degeneration in this fibro fatty protective tissue. Also, you can avoid flat or convex heel beds. The plantar fasciitis, which is also one of the chronic injuries in which is the metatarsophalangeal joint of the big two extension, especially with running on hard surface, reduce a windless stress over the plantar fascia, lifting the longitudinal arch of the foot. This can lead to periosteal irritation. This periosteal irritation can lead to periosteal reaction and reduce a heel spur, which is called the calcaneal spur. It represents by pain at the medial aspect of the heel and exaggerated by tiptoeing, especially early in the morning with the first steps. The treatment of this condition 
is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Here rise for four to eight millimeters and physiotherapy. The physiotherapy can be produced in the form of stretching exercise and shock waves. We can see this is the site of the pain of the plantar fascia at the medial border of the heel. And to be differentiated from other causes of foot and ankle pain, we can see this is Achilles tendonitis. And this is the site of tendonitis, tendonitis to tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior tendons. And this is the site of pain for stress fractures. And this is the site for the pain of the anterior metatarsalgia. And finally, this is the site of pain for onions. The calcaneonavicular ligament sprain. The calcaneonavicular ligament is a blunter ligament between the calcaneus and the navicular bone. This sprain ligament supports the head of the talus. Injury to the ligament, which can be acutely injured, can lead to blunter flexion of the head of the talus. This blunter flexion can cause acute flat foot. Clinically, the sprain of the calcaneonavicular ligament or the sprain ligament can lead to pain and tenderness on the medial arch of the foot. This can be treated by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, physiotherapy, and orthotics. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy of the foot. This syndrome is associated with strains, sprains, lacerations, or foot surgery. Clinically, there is a painful foot, hypersensitive to touch, moist, with stiff joints and atrophic muscles. It can be a chronic sequelae for any of these lesions. X-rays for the reflex sympathetic dystrophy of the foot show osteopenia and soft tissue swelling. And we can see the osteopenia and the swelling of the soft tissue around the ankle and foot. The treatment consists of aggressive physiotherapy protocol together with neurotonics and vitamin C supplementation. The anterior metatarsalgia, usually caused by overburnated foot or excessive mobility of the forest metatarsal. Clinically, it represented by tenderness over the blunter aspect of the metatarsal heads and presence of callosities under the second and third metatarsal heads. This is the callosities. Treatment of the condition represent a callosities care and orthotics together with physiotherapy. Another picture of injury in which is a sesamoiditis. Sesamoid bone in the tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis. These are the sesamoid bones, which are two sesamoid bones. Can be a source of injury due to fractures, avulsions, or osteonecrosis of the sesamoid bone. And in this x ray, we can show a fractured sesamoid bone in which these two parts, one part and the second part. For pain in the blunter aspect of the metatarsophalangeal joint, we can do this X-ray, CT, or poly scan. The treatment consists of avoidance of elevated heels, as elevated heels lead to increased pressure on the somite bone and increases stresses over these somites. Together with the rest and protective bedding, but surgical incision may be indicated for resistant cases.
Achilles injuries. Degeneration is commonly occurs at two to five centimeters above the insertion of the Achilles tendon at this area. This site of degeneration have a watershed blood supply. This watershed blood supply can lead to degeneration and rupture of the Achilles tendon. The predisposing factor for Achilles injuries are the lack for real foot support, excessive training loads, overpronation, hind foot deformities, either valgus or varus heel deformities, and tight calf muscles. Imaging used for diagnosis of Achilles degeneration or rupture is the ultrasound or MRI. This can show degeneration, cyst formation, and calcification. This is the degeneration of the Achilles tendon. Treatment represents a correction of the predisposing factors and surgical debridement and reconstruction. This reconstruction can be done with augmentation according to the gap and the degenerated area. Stress fractures. Stress fractures occur most often in the second and the third metatarsa. In this X-ray, we show we can see this crack, this crack in the second metatarsal cone, which is not reached to the lateral cortex. But stress fractures are also common in the calcaneus, fibula, talus, and the navicular bone together with the base of the fifth metatarsal, which is called the Jones fracture. Like that. This is the Jones, Jones fracture, stress fracture. Clinically, there is a pain that diminishes during rest. X-ray, MRI, and bone scan can be used for diagnosis. Treatment consists of rest, ice, compression, with activity modification and protective footwear or casting. In some cases, surgical fixation may be an option for rapid recovery, as in this case of the base fifth, in which surgical cannulated screw percutaneously introduced to allow rapid recovery. The injury prevention, I will not take a time for the injury prevention as there is an next lecture with Dr. Daniel Haverkamp will cover this injury prevention. Thank you for attention. And any questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So we have one question so far. So I would just encourage everyone, if you have any questions, please send them now. Otherwise we'll just answer this question and then finish up. So somebody asked if you can please elaborate a bit on why the active rehabilitation should be delayed in deltoid ligament injuries. Yeah, the active rehabilitation shouldn't be delayed. The active rehabilitation should start, but the uh, intense movements and uh, introduction, in, in, participation in running and uh, uh, vigorous exercises can lead to a stretch on the deltoid ligament, which can lead to chronic instability. This chronic instability can lead to surgical intervention to reconstruct the ligament. So early active exercise is allowed, but is a gradual form. Thanks. Okay, um, somebody asked uh, about your opinion on the management of bone edema in navicular bone. Uh, bone edema 
can be uh, treated with early active exercise together with vitamin C introduction. This vitamin C is very important and they have a, a recent rule in minimize the bone marrow edema. Together with proprioception exercise, this proprioception exercise can minimize the bone marrow edema, which can last for weeks or even months after the injury. Okay. okay, that's all the questions. So we will finish up there. Thank you very much again, Professor. We've got a lot of comments that this was a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, for everyone's information, we are back again next Tuesday, the 8th at 2 p.m. Central European time. And next week we focus on prevention and rehabilitation of knee injuries with Professor Greta Nicholbus, Professor of Rehabilitation and Prevention, Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences. And yep, so uh, that is coming up next Tuesday and we will see you then. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.